Thank you, Mark, for that uh, generous, uh, <coughs> generous introduction. And, and, uh, and Paul and, uh, and Steve, uh, the opportunity to uh, follow on the knowledge, building knowledge theme is perfect. So if we could uh, get the first slide up, I'll, I'll jump in. So I've, I've titled this presentation, Driving Innovation and Abundance. And at the end of the day, we're, we are building an extraordinary world ahead. And you're building an extraordinary world ahead. And I, I want to, through this presentation, really give you a sense of what the technologies coming down the pike are that are going to transform how you do your work and what technologies you use and how you interface with your customers, your clients, your employees, not in 20 or 50 years, but this decade. And I also want to show you how, despite all the negativism you're seeing from DC or in the news, the world is getting better and extraordinary, right? So I'm going to hit on three subjects. The first is what I call 10 to the 9th thinking, how technologies are coming online today that it can impact a billion people overnight, crowdsourcing genius, and this theme of abundance. So I'm someone who believes that in the next 20 to 30 years, we're going to be able to meet the needs of every man, woman, child on this planet. And when I speak about something like that, people look at me, you know, sort of, really, do you think that, I mean, that's a kind of a crazy idea, Peter, and how can you possibly believe that's going to happen? And when I think about why I have a disconnect from the way most people are seeing the future, the realization is that most of us, Myself, many times, all of us, most of the time, see the future really through the lens of the past. We're linear thinkers. You see, as humans, as we evolved on the plains of Africa hundreds of thousands of years ago, millions of years ago, the wetware and hardware of our brains was shaped by our environment. We, as a human being, are really have been evolved to meet the needs of our environment. And our environment back then on the savannas of Africa was living in a world that was local and linear. What I mean by that was that everything that affected you back then was within a day's walk. Right? If, if something happened on the other side of the planet, you knew nothing about it. So we lived in a very local situation. It was linear in that the life of your great-grandparents, your parents, you, your kids, their kids, nothing changed millennium to millennium, century to century, generation to generation. Things were pretty constant. So the way our brain was been wired to think is we think in a local and linear fashion. But today, the world is anything but that, right? Today, the world is global and exponential. Something happens in China or India, we know about it microseconds later. At least our computers do. You know, not only do things change century to century or decade to decade, things are changing year to year. Now, if you graph this, this plot is what you get. You see the red line down at the bottom that's us. It's us humans. It's our employees. It's our uh, customers. It's our politicians. We are linear thinkers. We think in very linear fashion. You know, we like waking up in the morning and knowing that the world is pretty much the same as it was the day before. But that yellow line, that yellow line is the technological world we're living in. It's growing exponentially. It's doubling in power year on year on year. And an exponential is a simple doubling. And the difference between the way we think and that the way the world is changing depending on your point of view, is either creating sort of a disruptive stress or a disruptive opportunity. So let me give you an example that sort of brings this home. Kodak. The year is 1996. Kodak has just turned over 100 years old. It's a mainstay company of the, the US Dow, if you would. A $28 billion market cap, 140,000 employees. They didn't recognize what business they were in. They didn't realize the power of technology was coming along. And literally, last year in 2012, Kodak goes bankrupt. Do you know that the digital cameras that put them out of business, they invented? They held the patents. They held the technology rights. They didn't understand what business they were in. They said, we're Kodak. We're, we make beautiful, high-resolution imagery. This digital camera, it's a toy for kids. Well, that toy literally put them out of business. You know, I redefine Kodak moment now as when you forget what technology or what business you're really in. 
And to put an exclamation point on the end of that, in that same year, 2012, last year, another imagery company, Fa uh, Instagram, is acquired by Facebook for a billion dollars with 13 employees. So if you remember nothing else, please, this is your knowledge moment, if you would, for this, uh, for this talk, that we're going from a world of linear thinking to exponential thinking. That you have to realize that if you've been a linear thinker, if your company's been in a linear industry, you can be disrupted by exponential technologies coming along out of no place. And exponentials grow so powerfully fast that even a $28 billion market cap company like Kodak can be put out of business if you're not watching. So I study these things. I started a university called Singularity University up in Silicon Valley. It's partnered, um, as Mark said, with, with uh, some great companies, uh, with NASA, with Autodesk, with Google, Cisco, Nokia. And we study the most powerful technologies in the world and where these, comp where these technologies are today in the lab and what's coming to market in the next two, five, and 10 years. And we run executive programs, we run graduate programs. In fact, one of the programs uh, I'd love to talk to you about, we're going to be creating a program called The Future of Manufacturing, where how are these technologies really going to be transforming manufacturing industries over this next decade? So what does exponential growth feel like? Well, if I were to take 30 linear steps, and we all are linear thinkers, you know, I could predict roughly in 30 linear steps, you know, 30 meters if you would, I'm going to be you know, basically in that corner of the room. If I ask any of you where you're going to be in five steps or 10 steps, we all do really well, sort of, you know, I'm going to be right there or right there, you know, with five or 10%. We're great at linear projection. But if I were to say to you, where are you going to be in 30 exponential steps, where an exponential is a simple doubling, one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, where are you going to be in 30 doublings? Very few would say what the answer is, which is I'm going to be a billion meters away. Or put another way, I will have gone around the planet 26 times. So that disconnect between the ease at which the hard wiring of our brain, because we evolved in a local and linear environment, can make linear projections where we don't really, we're shocked, surprised, disrupted by the rapidity of exponential growth. That's what gives you a Kodak moment. I'm going to start using that. I like that term. Um, all of this is being powered by the rate at which computers are getting faster. And we sort of have you know, accepted this when we go to Best Buy and the computer we buy this year for 1000 bucks is twice as fast as the computer we bought last year for 1000 bucks. That's nice. But what we don't realize is the power that this is having on the world. So this is a chart showing over the last 110 years how much computing power $1,000 of constant year dollars could buy you. And in the beginning, the early computers were electromechanical. You turn the crank, literally. Then relays and vacuum tubes and transistors and today integrated circuits. And over the last 100 years, this is on the log scale on the left, by the way. Over the last 100 years, please notice one thing. The rate at which computers have been getting faster is so smooth, so predictable. It doesn't go up in wartime and down in downtime. You know, it doesn't go uh, you know, up in boom time and down in, in depressions. It's pretty much faster computers being used to build faster computers. And it's a pretty smooth function. So you could probably project where this is going to be going in the next 100 years. And if you do that, here's what you get. So the computer running this presentation uh, is running at about 100 billion calculations in a second. 10 to the 11th cycles per second, which still is a number that you know, blows me away. But on this continuously smooth curve, 10 years from now, in 2023, the average $1,000 laptop is going to be calculating at the rate of the human brain, about 10 to the 16th cycles per second. So what happens when your average $1,000 laptop can, can calculate at the same rate at which our auditory and visual cortex does pattern recognition. Well, you know, your kid's homework gets a lot easier, that's true. Um, but it doesn't stop there, does it? Because 25 years later, the average $1,000 laptop is now calculating at the rate of the entire human race. Now it starts to get interesting. So these are a few covers 
that demonstrate the kinds of technologies entering our world. And I'm going to give you, in the next you know, six or seven minutes, sort of a quick overview of the kinds of exponential technologies we teach to our executive programs at Singularity University. And you know, AI, cloud computing, robotics, 3D manufacturing. I'll skip a few of them just because of the time constraints. But we're going to talk about 3D manufacturing. You know, the second cover here is that we're actually working in labs today about how to interface the digital internet into the human brain. You know, the matrix is happening in terms of the technologies coming in the labs at UCSD and in optogenetics and at DARPA in uh, man-machine interface. So one of the most powerful technologies I want to speak about is the whole field of artificial intelligence, AI. Now, AI is really the ability for a computer to understand what you're asking for, your intent in natural language, and then be able to interpret what you really want and give you back the answer. So imagine having any number of experts available on demand with all the knowledge in the world, being able to understand the nuance of what you're asking for. Now, IBM, a few years ago, built a computer called Watson. It was named after IBM's founder, James Watson. And to demonstrate how purely awesome this computer is, they decided to go up against the two all-time Jeopardy champions. The guy who had won the most money and the guy who had won the most number of games. And you can guess who won. Uh, I love the title here, Watson Vanquishes Human Opponents. So just to prep you on this, Watson was a, is a computer uh, in a, a, you know, a series of servers, probably uh, not more than you know, 10, 15 feet by 8 feet by 10 feet in size. And it wasn't hooked up to the internet. It had downloaded Wikipedia. And, but it wasn't, to make it fair, it didn't have internet access during this game competition. It had to process the knowledge it had downloaded. And it had to understand human language, you know, when irony or, or humor or the, any, the aspects that make it difficult in the past for, hum, for computers to understand this and answer the question. And let me show you a short clip of what it looks like. Ken, you're in the first position. Please make a selection. Oh, I've never said this on TV. Chicks dig me for 200, please, Jimmy. <laughs> Kathleen Kenyon's excavation of this city mentioned in Joshua showed the walls had been repaired 17 times. Watson. What is Jericho? Correct. 400, same category. This mystery author and her archaeologist hubby dug in hopes of finding the lost Syrian city of Urkesh. <clears throat> Watson. Who is Agatha Christie? Correct. Watson. Who is Mary Leaking? You're right. Watson. What is creeped? Yes. Let's finish Chicks Dig Me. Edmund? I, I swear they did that on purpose. So I want you to imagine the power of Watson on the, on the cloud, accessible to anyone with a cell phone, being able to have a conversation, ask a question, have the answer. You see, what Watson really is, is sheer computing power. Infinite computing power is way that my colleagues at Autodesk describe it. What used to be the scarcest resource on the planet is now available literally for pennies on the dollar. You know, 30 years ago, if you needed to have 100 computers at your beck and call to do some computational capability, you'd have to have been, you know, the, the head of the Defense Department or the, you know, president of MIT. Now anyone, anywhere on the planet can have one computer, 100 computers, 1,000 computers for a minute, a day, a year on the cloud. What was once the scarcest resource is now effectively cheap, the cost of electricity. So think about the notion when in the future a client is sitting here having a conversation with Watson and saying, you know, I want my house to be 10% bigger. I'd love it to be, you know, now change the colors here. No, I want it to be more fuel efficient. And no, I, I need it, you know, I need it cheaper than that. And you're having a conversation and the AI is helping to modify and do the thermal analysis and, and literally do the, you know, all of the design work and saying, okay, this meets your specifications. So we're going to start into an arena where AI is going to become uh, your best friend or potentially competitor 
depending on how you interface with that capability. Here's another field coming online that we talk about in great detail at Singularity, which is the whole field of robotics. This is a robot called the PR2, uh, built by uh, Scott Hassan, who made his initial wealth out of Google. Uh, and this is a computer that's able to literally uh, manipulate and see things as a human can. This next robot is uh, coming from Boston Dynamics. You may have seen it, called Big Dog. Uh, and there's a whole slew of robots coming down the line that have extraordinary capabilities. This is called Cruelty to Robots. <laughs> and I have an emotional reaction when the guy kicks the robot. I don't know if, if you do. But it's like, you know, whoa, what are you doing there? But these robots are going to become your future workforce. And I'm not talking about 30 or 50 years. I'm talking about this decade. We're going to see robots entering every phase of manufacturing. So these are robots that work 24-7, don't have to be given drug screens, don't show up late for work, don't have unions, don't have, don't have, don't have. How is that going to change your industry? And you know, we talk about the United States losing jobs to China and India. Well, those jobs get lost to robots where the cost of electricity here is the same price as the cost of electricity there. So, I, you know, my goal here is to give you knowledge of where things are going so you can prep for this entering into your industries. Other robots, this is friends of mine at Google, Larry Page in the driver's seats on my board at the XPRIZE Foundation, Sergey Brin who runs us in the back, and you've heard about Google's autonomous car. Well, every car manufacturer now is beginning to build these kinds of autonomous systems. So they've built early on you know, six Prius vehicles, a, a few uh, Lexus vehicles. They've driven 300,000 miles fully autonomously. And this is a car that's fully autonomous. Look at that device that's spinning on the roof over there. I'm going to show you that in a moment. These cars are now becoming legal in Nevada, California, and Florida. How many of you have large workforces of drivers that you will not have to pay after your autonomous vehicles are making deliveries on their own. So this is what the actual car is seeing as it's going down the road. That LiDAR on the top is a, basically a laser detection and raging device. It's got 64 lasers that are doing 10 RPMs, and it's generating 750 megabytes per second of data. That LiDAR is seeing everything around it, every you know, person, every car, every stop sign, every light. It's also seeing people you know, walking along the streets. It's recording all of this data and able to literally have a 360 view of knowledge far better than any human can. So as I drive in the back of these cars, which I have, after a few minutes, you know, I trust that car better than a human driver. It's got far more capability to drive safely. So look at how this may transform your industries in the near future. Another technology coming online is the whole field of 3D printing, digital manufacturing, where we're starting to create and print things, not in two dimensions like a sheet of paper, but actually three dimensions. And these are devices, it's the closest thing to the Star Trek replicator. These are devices that can print layer on top of layer on top of layer and print any three-dimensional structure out of steel, out of titanium, out of plastic, out of cement. So let me show you some examples. This is a a plastic polygon within a polygon within a polygon, all printed at once. So you have working parts within working parts printed from the bottom up. These are, are high temperature titanium turbine blades. This is a new type of photo booth out of Japan where they take a photograph of you and then print a 3D figurine. This is a person who lost his, left, his right lower limb. They scanned his left limb flipped the image and printed a 3D composite prosthetic. This is a full-scale motorcycle that was printed in the, in the, except for the engine in the hall of Autodesk. And applicable to you, there's a whole series of technologies coming on down on 3D printing of homes and buildings. So imagine being able to literally have a device that's able to take you know, earth, water, aggregate, cement, whatever it might be, and have an infinite number of homes. So that in the developing world, at least, a, a person who's got you know, six kids can say, hmm, out of the 100 uh, designs, I like that one, print. And have this thing literally print 
a 3D cement structure or concrete structure. And, but these are kinds of technologies coming down the pike that I think as an industry you need to be aware of. So this first part I spoke about in our knowledge session here is the technologies coming down. The second part I want to talk about is how do you crowdsource solutions by getting the smartest people in the world to help you solve your problems. So I've been a space cadet since my childhood. I grew up wanting to be an astronaut, born in the 60s, grew up in the 70s during the Apollo program. I was watching Star Trek. I, I drank all the tang I could get my hands on. <laughs> and I've started a dozen companies. One of my companies does zero gravity flights. Another company sends people to the space station. Most recently, you may have read, I started a company backed by a group of eight billionaires to go out and mine metals and precious materials from asteroids. Long story. Um, <laughs> But my dream had been space flight. And I grew up believing that I could go to space and then gave up when NASA wasn't getting us there, at least wasn't getting us there. And I read it one day about Charles Lindbergh that he crossed the Atlantic in 1927 to win a $25,000 prize. Now, I thought Lindbergh just woke up one day in New York and Roosevelt Field and decided to fly east. But no, there was a, a prize offered for the first person to do this. And what was incredible was this $25,000 prize inspired nine different groups around the world who spent $400,000 trying to win Raymond Ortega's $25,000. And I said, well, that's interesting. If you have a difficult challenge you don't know how to solve, you can put up a prize, a very clear set of rules, and say, hey, whoever does this gets the money. Anyone who tries and loses doesn't get anything. And that's called an incentive prize. Well, amazingly, Lindbergh made that flight. And within 18 months of his flight across the Atlantic, the number of people buying tickets went from 6,000 to 180,000. His bold demonstration of flying the Atlantic created the marketplace and launched a $300 billion aviation industry. So going back to my childhood passion, I said, aha, I'm going to create a prize to drive people to build spaceships to take me and my friends into space. And it was, you know, when I read Lindbergh's bio, I wrote these rules down, and they held pretty true. $10 million was the amount of money I was going to offer. I didn't have the money, but that's what I wanted to offer. It had to be a spaceship that could carry three adults into space. So at the end of the competition, you'd have, you know, a working vehicle for a pilot and two paying passengers, or an autopilot and three very brave passengers. You had to go to 100 kilometers, land, and within two weeks make the trip again. Now, I called this the X Prize because I had no idea where I was going to get the money. And the X stood for the name of the person who would ultimately put up the cash. But I had raised about a half a million dollars from patrons in St. Louis and made the bold calculation I was going to announce this prize anyway. And so on stage with me to give this prize credibility, I had the head of NASA, the head of the FAA, the Lindbergh family, 20 astronauts, and we announced this $10 million competition, front page around the world. The media didn't ask, do you have the money? I did not. Do you have any teams? I did not. But I had the full intention and the, you know, confidence that who would not want to pay the $10 million you know, after the prize was won? So I set out on my journey to go out and raise the $10 million. And I sat down with Fred Smith at FedEx. Fred. The $10 million FedEx X Prize. It's got a great ring. Peter, I love the idea. It's great. You know, but why isn't NASA doing this? And can anyone really do it? And the clincher was, isn't someone going to die trying? It's like, oh my god. Went to Richard Branson and pitched him twice. Literally, over the course of five years, I did 150 pitches to CEOs, philanthropists, but told no after no after no. You see, I forgot how risk adverse we had gotten. And doing anything big and bold in the world takes risk. You know, the day before something is truly a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. And it, you know, if you're not allowed to take risk, if you're not allowed to take failure, then you can't do anything bold and new in the world. Long story short, five years later, I read in Fortune magazine about this woman, Anusha Ansari, born in Tehran, came over to the US, became a serial entrepreneur, had just sold her third company called 
telecom technologies to Sonus Networks for a billion dollars. And in her bio, it said her dream was to fly on a suborbital flight into space. He's like, my god, this is the person. <laughs> and after being told 150 times no, I was like, I, com I remember exactly where I was, where I committed to myself, I'm going to track her down. And I did, vacationing in Hawaii for the last two months after selling her company. I was her first meeting when she got back with her husband, Hamid, and they agreed on the spot to fund the competition. And we called it the Ansari X Prize in, in their honor. Amazingly, the competition worked again. We had 26 teams from seven countries around the world who spent $100 million to go after this competition. This was the winning vehicle, Spaceship One, built by a group of 30 engineers. That's it, 30 engineers in the Mojave Desert. Just think about the technologies that I spoke about in the first part and how that empowers small teams to do extraordinary things, things that only the largest governments and companies could ever do before. So here is the vehicle taking off using nitrous oxide and tire rubber as the fuel. Here she is at altitude and the winning moment down on the ground. On the far left is Anusha and Amir, her brother-in-law. Next to him is myself. Next to me is Paul Allen, who funded Burt Rutan, who's next to him to build it. Then Brian Binney. And here comes Richard Branson, after turning me down twice. <laughs> who the week before comes in and negotiates the rights to the winning technology. And that's why he's Richard Branson, right? <laughs> but I'm thankful, I'm thankful, first of all, uh, he's given me my seat to go and fly on Virgin Galactic, but he committed a quarter of a billion dollars to commercialize the technology, which was our goal in the first place. And today there have been, you know, nearly a thousand people who put down deposits to fly privately in space, which was the mission and the whole vision of the X Prize. So we had 10 billion media impressions. You know, all the people who turned me down for funding it called me up and said, ah, Peter, I wish we had done that. It was amazing. You know, we made the homepage of Google. And let me take you back there with a, a short video to give a flavor of what that was like. We're announcing today something called the X Prize, a $10 million contest to privately build a spaceship that's able to carry three individuals, fly to 100 kilometers altitude, and do that twice inside of two weeks. I have never been myself as creative as I have eyeballing this goddamn prize. Hello and welcome to Mojave here in the high desert of California on this incredible day. Now you are gonna witness history in the making. Release our fire. The Ansari X Prize inspired international competition, drove regulatory reform, and made history. The X Prize for right. 10 million. It ignited a personal spaceflight revolution. And now the winning vehicle, Spaceship One, is hanging in the center of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, right above the Apollo 11 capsule, next to the Spirit of St. Louis that inspired it in the first place. How cool is that, huh? <laughs> Thank you. So the hallmarks of an X Prize, of an incentive competition, and I'm sharing this with you because this may be the sort of technology that, as an industry, you may want to use to improve technologies and techniques, challenges that you have. Because when you create a competition and you challenge the world to help you solve it, you get 10 to 40 times the prize money being spent to win it. You only pay the winner. You can spark a new industry, and you can drive non-traditional solutions. On the heels of that, we built a world-class board of trustees. I was very honored to have folks like Larry Page, the CEO of Google, Ratan Tata, chairman of, of, of Tata Industries, uh, Nusha Ansari, James Cameron, the producer, uh, Elon Musk, uh, Jim Giannopoulos, the chairman, CEO of Fox, Ray Kurzweil, you may know others here, that joined our board to say, let's look at creating X prizes for the world's biggest challenges. And we're now creating X prizes in a whole range of areas, um, literally in areas that are uh, in the fields of energy, in the environment. And my uh, computer is telling me it's stuck. It's 
excuse me a second, to, uh, to drive uh, breakthroughs in a, a multitude of different areas. So Microsoft making its debut. Um, talk about, uh, yeah, talk about AI coming online. Um, at the end of the day, our mission at the X Prize is really to drive radical breakthroughs. Let me. Uh, apologize for this, folks. is really to drive radical breakthroughs in a range of different ideas, in energy and environment, in life sciences, in education, and global development. Some of the prizes we've launched since then, Google's funded us to do a $30 million private race to the moon as a follow-on. We literally have 24 teams around the world who are racing for the price of $30 million put up by Google, and literally uh, $30 million put up by NASA to go to the lunar surface. We've got prizes that are uh, that are going on in the field of, uh, of a range of areas. Does it have to be a $10 million prize? It does not. If you remember the BP oil spill that was going on and on and on, uh, James Cameron had just joined our board of trustees, and he said, you've got to do something about that. And at the end of the day, when we looked at the BP oil spill and said, what can we do? We said, you know, capping the spill is not going to be an option. But if we can, in fact, figure out how to clean up the oil spill on the ocean surface before it hits the land, that would be extraordinary. So we went out to our benefactors, Wendy Schmidt, uh, the head of the Schmidt Family Foundation. Eric, her husband, is the chairman of Google, put up the prize money and challenged teams, can you, in fact, at least double the rate at which oil spills are cleaned up? which is something that hadn't happened in 21 years since Exxon Valdez. So we went to the world's largest oil spill cleanup facility, which is right here in New Jersey called OMSET. We ended up having 350 plus teams around the world enter the competition. We narrowed it down to 10 finalists and said, if you can double the oil spill cleanup rate, you'll win the $1.4 million. So this was interesting. Seven of the 10 teams, all of them, you know, well under 100 employees, doubled the rate at which we could clean up oil spills. The top team increased it sixfold. Now, what really blew me away was that one of these teams that doubled the oil spill cleanup rate was a team that was not in this industry at all, that literally six months earlier had met in a Las Vegas tattoo parlor. Let me show you that video. <laughs> My full-time job back home is uh, running a tattoo studio in Las Vegas. We get asked all the time, go, how long have you been in the oil industry? And I, well, counting today? So my question to you is, how many of you would have backed that guy to go and do it? And when you're creating a competition to solve your problems, the beautiful thing about it is, you don't have to pre-guess who the winner is. There is so much genius out there in the world that comes and looks at your problem in a different way and literally can bring novel solutions. Because sometimes the expert is the person who can tell you exactly how it can't be done. You know what I mean? So where are we going next? Uh, we've just launched something called the Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize. We're asking teams around the world to build a handheld mobile device that a mom could use at 2 a.m. in the morning if her kid is sick, whether you're in the Bronx or whether you're in the middle of Tanzania. And this is a device that you can talk to because it's got Watson on the cloud. You know, you can cough on it. It can do the RNA and DNA analysis of the, of the, of the bacteria in your sputum. You can do a finger blood prick and diagnose you better than a team of board certified doctors. What's so cool about this, it's funded by Qualcomm, 
is that literally after announcing it, a year later, we have over 250 teams around the world in 33 countries competing for this. And we expect a winner in the next three years. Literally transform the field of medicine. We're working on a global literacy X Prize, asking teams around the world to create a technology that could literally bring 200 illiterate kids to full stage three English literacy in the fastest, most scalable fashion. There are 880 million illiterate people on this planet. Another fun one you may appreciate is earthquake prediction. Working on this right now, you know, can we in fact predict earthquakes with a 30 minute, a one hour, a one day notice? I mean, think about the lives that would be saved if that was possible. So what I've shown you here is my point of view of the world. Exponential technologies that empower you to do extraordinary things, the ability to crowdsource genius to solve problems that you may not know how to solve. That gave me a perspective to write my book, Abundance. Now, I wrote this book. I was very proud of it. It came flowing out of me because it was something I had to do. Number one in Amazon, number two in New York Times. And as I, as I wrote about this, this concept, you know, I would tell people out there in the world that the world is getting better at an extraordinary rate. And people's response to that was, you know, really? Really, Peter? I mean, haven't you seen, you know, the, the shootings here and the economic crisis there and the political standstill here? How can you possibly say that the world is getting better at an extraordinary rate? And when I saw it through their eyes, through most people's eyes, different from the way I was seeing the world, it hit me that, ladies and gentlemen, we're living in a day and age where the news media is a drug pusher. And negative news is their drug. And on every device that you have, day in and day out, on your smartphones, on your laptops, on your tablets, on your radio, on your television, in newspapers, you are getting negative stories pushed to you over and over and over again. And there's a reason for this. You see, as we evolved on the plains of Africa again, if you missed a piece of good news, well, that's OK. But if you missed a piece of bad news, it could be your life. A squiggle on the ground may be a stick or it may be a snake. A rustle in the leaves could be a tiger or could be the wind. And so in our brains, we evolved something called the amygdala, a little piece of the temporal lobe that every piece of visual and auditory data comes to the amygdala first. It's your early warning system, and it filters everything for negative news. And so you pay 10 times more attention to negative news than positive news. And the media knows this. And that's why when you open a newspaper and you look for the good news, it's a tenth of the stories. Because you don't pay attention to that stuff. If it bleeds, it leads. But let me tell you what the actual story is. You see, over the last hundred years, it's been an extraordinary century. Over the last hundred years, the cost of food has come down 13-fold. The cost of energy has come down 20-fold. The, the cost of, of transportation 100-fold and communications over 1,000-fold. The human lifespan has more than doubled. The per capita income for every nation on this planet has more than tripled. And a friend of mine, Steven Pinker at Harvard, who just published a book on this subject, has shown us we are living during the most peaceful time ever in human history. But you wouldn't know that from watching the media, would you? Every single skirmish, every warfare is broadcast in HD over and over again to your, to your living rooms. So, it turns out that what has made this extraordinary century so great has been the drive of technology. You see, technology is something that takes that which was scarce and makes it abundant. And I open my book with the story of aluminum, which is why the cover is a faux aluminum, if you would, cover. And the story is one of this man, Napoleon III. The year is 1840. Napoleon has invited the king of Siam over to the palace in Versailles in France. And to demonstrate his extraordinary ability, Napoleon feeds all of his troops with silver utensils. Napoleon himself is fed with gold utensils. And the king of Siam is fed with aluminum utensils. You see, aluminum in 1840 was the most precious metal on the planet. Even though it makes up 8.3% of the earth by weight, 
All of the aluminum, as you may well know, is bound with oxygen and silicates to form bauxite, a brown clay-like substance. You can't go into the ground and dig out pure aluminum. It doesn't exist. And it was so energetically difficult to extract the aluminum from the bauxite that it's worth more than platinum and gold, which is why the tip of the Washington Monument, built in that same decade in DC, the capstone is made of aluminum. And then a technology came along called electrolysis that made it so cheap to extract the aluminum from the bauxite that we now use it with a throwaway mentality. You know, the last time I went dumpster diving for aluminum was a long time ago. <laughs> but honestly, literally, what else in our world do we see as scarce that could become abundant? You know, people talk about energy scarcity. Oh my God, we're living in a world of energy scarcity. Well, we live on a planet that is bathed in 5,000 times more energy than we consume as a species in a year. We don't have, you know, a scarcity of energy. We have a scarcity of energy in a useful form. And there are extraordinary technologies coming down the pike there. Literally, the cost of solar is dropping exponentially while our global production rate is exploding. In your industry, I guarantee you, this is going to become a mainstay part of the energy systems that you're installing over these next few decades. And if we have abundant energy, we live on a water planet. People talk about water wars and water scarcity. Two thirds of our planet is covered with water. Yes, 97.5% of salt water, 2% of the polar ice caps, and we fight over a half a percent of the water on this planet. But if we have abundant energy, we have abundant water as well. And literally, there are technologies that are going to be transforming that as well. This Maasai warrior on a cell phone has better mobile communications than President Reagan did 25 years ago. And if they're on a smartphone on Google, they have access to more knowledge and information than President Clinton did just 15 years ago. And on that smartphone, what do they have? Two-way video conferencing, HD video, HD still cameras. They have GPS. They've got things that we would have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars just 20 years ago available for free. This is the world that we're transforming and living into. We talked about the Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize that's going to be giving anyone with access to a smartphone abundant health care. I'll end on this notion, what I call the rising billion, because it's an important part of your seeing the future economy of the planet. You see, if you look at the number of people on Earth, we've just crossed the 7 billion mark. We're on our way to somewhere between 9 to 10 billion people on the planet. But that's not the point of the slide. In 2010, we had just shy of 2 billion people connected on the internet. 2 billion. By the end of this decade, in 2020, we're going to be going from 2 billion people to literally 5 billion people connected on the internet. 3 billion new minds who have never been heard from before are about to enter the global economy. What do these people want? What will they buy? What will they create? What will they discover? What will they desire? These 3 billion new minds, for me, represent literally the beginning of the greatest epic of innovation this planet has ever seen. They represent tens of trillions of dollars flowing into the global economy. If they're not your customers, they're your customers' customers. So I'll end on this note that we are in an extraordinary day and age where the technologies that are coming online right now are going to transform every aspect of society, every aspect of our industries. They're going to allow us to do far more with far less. They're going to create a world that is far more interconnected, far richer, and far more powerful than ever before. Ladies and gentlemen, we are entering a world of abundance. Thank you.